you. Good morning. Our reading today will come from Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through verse 24. I'll be reading it in a moment or two in the context of the sermon. I would ask that you would bow your heads for a moment and let me pray before I begin. God, thank you for this beautiful anthem, for this beautiful church, and for this challenging word that we will hear today from the prophet Amos. As we take another step in this series, may you speak to our hearts and guide us and direct us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may you take the humble word I prepared, animate it, empower it, and strengthen it through your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the last week, one of the caseworkers for Youth and Family Services came to the church and brought a young man with him and explained to me that he needed some help because he had no place to stay that night because he had run out of his monthly check money and it was cold and wouldn't know if we could help. Now, now this young man is not a, is not a stranger to me. It's someone that Kevin and I or Whitney are very familiar with that we have an ongoing relationship with for more than 12 months. And so because it was a cold day and because it's just what we do when we can is we help. So he got in my car and um, on the way to where he had been staying, I was going to go and pay for his rent for another eight days So because he's in process of getting some permanent housing. And they keep delaying the permanent housing because of various circumstances. So on the way to taking him to where he's staying, I said, when was the last time you had something to eat? He said, a day or so ago. That's because where he's staying, it costs him $850 a month to stay there, and he gets a check once a month for $900. That's his only income. Can you imagine living on $50 a month? So uh, we went to Brahms. I bought him a bag of burgers. (laughs) I said, you can put the other ones in your refrigerator. It's six burgers and, you know... uh, whole bunch of french fries and got him a, the biggest drink we could get with no ice to maximize the drink and we drove over to a place that's less than a mile from here stays in a place called studio star you probably have never been there it's on the other side of yale behind the quick trip and let me just say this about studio star um when people fly into tulsa where people come to vacation here or come to visit here, they don't stay at Studio Star. <laughs> Studio Star is a place uh, that is kind of a place where you go when you have no other place to go, and they offer a, a good service to people who have no other place and no affordable housing. And people, it's very transitory. When I got over there, the caseworker met me over there, and I found out that he has a lot of other people that uh, live there, that he, and he spends a lot of time over there caring for people, and this caseworker is a hero, probably paid very little bit of money to do a lot of good work for people, trying to help them put resources together and match people with resources to get people help when there's not a lot of money to help people. So I pay, I pay the rent, and it's not the first time I've done that. We've actually been taking care of his rent for over a month in this place, and uh, it's just an assault to the census, this hotel. Just to be honest, it's an assault to the census. While I was there, a guy came in with a big crate, a dog crate with two puppies in it, and said, and I don't know why this bothered me so much. I mean, it bothered me that he had no place to stay, but there was something about somebody bringing in uh, a crate with two puppies in it and then trying to give them away, saying, I got some puppies for free. Anybody want a puppy? And just the whole situation, there was just... So much desperation in the situation. Honestly, um, I'm an emotional person. I'm not one that cries very often. But in my way home in the car, I just, I just teared up. It just, it just broke my heart. Broke my heart. Now, this individual that we're helping, if you were to meet him, you might immediately, on some days of the week, you might think he was drunk or drug addicted. But he does no alcohol, doesn't drink any alcohol, he doesn't do any drugs. Uh, he he's, suffers from mental illness. But once a month he gets a shot, and it's a really 
horrible shot that in, impacts his clarity, his thinking, and he shakes, he gets feverish, and he can't talk. But if you just saw this individual on the street, you would think he was addicted or an alcoholic or something like that, and you know, was on the street because of that reason. But in order to be able to help someone like my friend and our friend, you got to know their story. And the reality is there's people all over our community who have stories that we just don't know their story. We're quick to form judgments from the comfort of where we live. And I tell you the story not to pat us on the back or to say, oh, look at the good we're doing or anything like that. I tell you the story because in our community, and you know this, there are people within a mile here who are living a very different story. And thank God for all the people in our community, social workers, uh, people like the Kaiser Family Foundation and churches and Iron Gate and all the things that, that we try to get involved with. We had people today at Iron Gate feeding today. They, they put up 221 people uh, over the cold snap in hotels. We support them. Thank God for, for those individuals. But the reason I tell you the story is, is to remind you and to bring to your attention that there are people in our community living very different stories and that if we're going to do something to truly change this situation, it requires a lot of effort. Because people get into this position not overnight. This individual comes from a long family, a long history of mental illness. And has been in and out of homes for, for decades. And I want to tell you, I got, on the phone, got a phone call with uh, Brad Johnson, who's the founder of Eden, uh, Eden Village. And uh, we're trying to match this person up to get the tiny home that we purchased as a church. And we're going to put him, if we can, if he meets the qualifications, put him in that tiny home. And you're going to get to be a part of that celebration if we're able, if we're able to make that work. You see, helping people doing, and let me use the word, justice. Justice is loving your neighbor and doing the right thing to help things, make things better for other people who are not having the same experience as you are. Justice is getting, giving God what God wants. It's not easy. It's more than just giving someone a handout. It's not charity. It's seeing the dignity in another human being and then helping them get up on their feet and do the right thing. We, we've been talking for over a month now about virtues and forgotten virtues. And there are four cardinal virtues which... Christian philosophers all the way back to Aquinas and Augustine and all the way back who have been saying that these are four virtues that all the moral teachings of Scripture rely upon. They're the hinge of them all. Prudence, which is how we make decisions based on God's wisdom. Uh, temperance, was, which is exercising self-control. Uh, fortitude, which is courage and, and resilience. We're talking about next week. But today it's the one on justice. Now I have to be really just transparent probably prayed more about this one than the others because uh, this is a controversial topic that we talk about in the world today. There is nothing wrong with the idea of social justice, but it's become so politicized and such, so divisive it's hard to talk about in today's world. The minute you bring up the word justice, people line up on different sides. It's a very misunderstood word. And not only is it challenging because it's a misunderstood word, it's challenging because justice is not an idea that God gives us. Justice is something that God gives us to do. And so I thought about calling Kevin and said, Kevin, you got this one like prudence. So I decided what I was going to do this morning, rather than just share my own opinion on the matter and what I think about needs to be done about all these social issues, I'm just going to tell you what the Scripture says about justice, let you form your own opinion. And I, I, I spent a lot of time reading through Scripture and landed on the prophet Amos. Amos in the Bible is, is not the person that makes cookies, so don't get confused. It's not that famous Amos. Bad joke. And by the way, when was the last time you heard a sermon on Amos? Never. Doesn't pop up any like, five ways to have a better marriage. Talk to Amos. You know, and Amos, you know, when you're reading those devotional books you buy for, you know, like Our Daily Bread, those sorts of things that you buy, you pick them up in the post. Amos is never quoted. Because Amos is kind of like a, he's a guy that shows up at the party and everybody goes to the other side of the room. But Amos 
lived a long time ago on the border of Judah and northern Israel. And northern Israel, at the time that Amos was living, had had its independence from Judah for about 150 years, a little squabble between in God's people. They divided into two countries. And at the time, there was a king by the name of Jeroboam II. And by all worldly standards, he was very, very successful. Military success, power, expanded the borders of northern Israel and brought a lot of wealth to the nation of Israel. But the prophets in the Hebrew Bible consider him to be one of the worst kings ever. Because with the wealth that he brought to God's people came spiritual apathy. He allowed for idolatry to take place and people began to worship other gods and they began to practice significant and gross injustice toward the poor. And so Amos is watching this at a distance, tending his figs and shepherding his sheep, and one day he says, I've had enough. Crosses the border and journeys up to the, to the spiritual capital of northern Israel, to Bethel, where there's a big temple, and began to preach. And you could probably sum up the message in this way. Hey, people, the party's over. God's not happy with the way that you're treating the poor and denying them justice. Now, if you're wondering where to find, uh, if you wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to get a stick in the eye and read Amos, let me tell you where to find it. Amos is at the end of the Old Testament, properly called the Hebrew Scriptures, and he's one of 12 major prophets. All these 12 major prophets deal with these concepts of injustice, justice, how we treat the poor, and so on and so on. The book of Amos is basically a collection of his poems, his letters, and his sermons, and his prophecies that have been collected into a book by an editor many years after his death so that we would have a sense of his message. And basically, the message was delivered to the people who benefited from the military strength and power of Jeroboam the king. Because in that time, much like the world we live in, there was a growing gap between the poor and the wealthy. And the wealthy became more and more insensitive toward the poor. In fact, their actions drove the poor into spiritual poverty and also into debt slavery. They were enslaved in debt and became slaves, and they were given no fair legal representation. They had no power to change their lives. And so Amos goes up to the Norman kingdom, and he asks this question. Have you forgotten where you came from? Aren't you the people that were once slaves in Egypt, making bricks out of straw? Weren't you the people at one time who were starving? And then God heard your cries? Delivered you from slavery, from the Pharaoh, and led you to the desert and gave you this land? Have you forgotten where you are? How dare you now do the very thing that God delivered you from? And so he gets to the point in the book, chapter 5, where he calls out their hypocrisy. And by the way, if you read Isaiah, you read Zechariah, read the other minor prophets, read the Psalms and Proverbs, other parts of the letter, you'll find out this is a constant refrain that God despises worship that's not connected to justice. He says in here that true worship will change the way you live and how you act with others. And he says, God hates your hypocrisy. By the way, this is not me. This is Amos, just in case you know, okay? God does not accept your worship. You worship me in vain. And this is what he says. He says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. 
Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music. I'm sorry. <laughs> of your harps. See? But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Now, these two words in the Hebrew Bible are so important to us as they were to them at that time. Righteousness is a Hebrew word, sedukah. And righteousness in the Bible, it's not being uppity or, you know, holier than now. Righteousness is about how we treat other people. It refers to a standard of right and equitable relationships between people, no matter their social differences. Its sister word in this text is the word justice. So justice, what that is, it's, it's the Hebrew word mishvat, which basically is about what you do because of righteousness. Because we're all meant to be able to live fairly in the world and have, have access to what God wants us to have access to. Justice then refers to the concrete actions that we take to correct injustice. So put aside everything that you hear on the news or in the papers or just in conversation. Let me give you a biblical definition of justice. The biblical definition of justice is that justice is God's expectations for right relationships among individuals and societies, emphasizing personal integrity and fair treatment for all, especially the poor and the left behind. This principle reflects God's own character and concern for how people treat each other, particularly the most vulnerable, and calls them to take action to make things right. Now, this is the biggest obstacle I have in talking about this, other than the politicalization of good Bible words, is that Christian people today tend to think of justice as just one part of God's Word, or optional, or secondary. So hear it from your minister today, that if you read Scripture and you think that justice is secondary, a secondary concern, hear it from me today, if we think that we are wrong. Because justice, in terms of doing right for others, caring for the poor, caring for the immigrant, caring for the stranger, making the world a better place for people, and fixing situations that are inherently unfair is not a secondary concern. It's not a Democrat concern. It's not a Republican concern. It is God's character and concern. And therefore, it should be our concern too. Jim Wallace, who founded an organization called Sojourners, he's an evangelical author, Christian, read a lot of books, said that when he went to seminary, they were given an assignment. They were supposed to uh, find all the places in the Bible that talk about wealth and poverty and helping the poor and justice. And then when they found them, they were supposed to cut it out of the Bible. They found 2,000 verses, cut them all out of the Bible, and he says that when you cut justice out of the Bible, you're then left with a Bible full of holes, a holy Bible, <laughs> okay? And by the numbers alone, justice is important to God. The words poor and poverty appear 446 times in 384 separate verses. Wealth can be found, talking about wealth and possessions and the danger of them can be found 1,453 times and justice appears 1,576 times, whereas hell only appears 237 times, heaven shows up 771 times, and the concept of love only 654 times. And whenever love shows up, it's not this sentimental, romantic kind of love. It's justice love. Building houses for the poor taking care of people, 
loving your neighbor enough to know their story. That's what it means. Now, if you read the Bible, or if I read the Bible, and I do not see justice as a major theme, or you either, you have to read it again. If you read the Bible, and you think that God's primary concern is getting people into heaven and not putting food in their stomachs, you are sadly mistaken. If we in this room read the Bible and are not made to feel somewhat uncomfortable because of how fortunate we are, not, we're not blessed, we're fortunate. If we do not feel uncomfortable what the Bible says about wealth and possessions and the world we live in, then we need to read it again. Because the Bible, because God, God shows favor for those who live on the bottom. And the Bible teaches to those who have been given much, much is expected. Because with great gifts come great responsibility. And for those who fail to live with those great responsibilities, says Amos, comes great consequences. Justice is applied the other way. So he says to them, seek God and live. And he gives them a judgment in the book. He says, your nation's coming down, and it happened in 722 B.C. The Assyrians came in and destroyed all of Israel. And at the end of the book, there's a word of hope. And the word of hope, it's only about six verses. You've got to work real hard to get to it. But when you get there, he says that God's going to do a new thing and that God's going to raise up a new people in this place, build new vineyards, and it's going to bring together people from all nations. It's going to be an inclusive kingdom. And by the way, as Christians, like Micah and other prophets like Isaiah and in Amos, there will be a new king who will come and inaugur inaugurate a new kingdom. And for us... Would you please say his name? Who? Jesus. That's how we read the scriptures. And so you can't understand who Jesus is unless you understand that Jesus came from this tradition. Uh, Jesus' purpose, he wants your life to be better, but you're not the sole object of his concern. The whole world is God's concern. For God so loved the world. And so you see, Jesus is called to reach the least, the lost, the left behind. The Sermon on the Mount takes a whole new perspective when you read it from this point of view. The Beatitudes are not about having a better attitude. The Beatitudes are about the poor and being a blessing to the poor and to those who mourn and grieve and who hunger for the world to be made right. So when the pastor stands up and talks about justice, before you say, well, I went to church today and the, the minister got, well, political. No, let me correct you. No, the pastor just got biblical. Somebody going to say amen? Okay, all right, all right. It's been nice working here, Kevin. <laughs> Scott, Scott is a member of our church. Scott Grindle, it sends the first service. He's a new deacon 18 months ago. God put a burden on his heart to become a volunteer for CASA. CASA, Corn Appointed Special Advocates. There are more than 1,000 kids in this county who are in the foster care system who are leaving behind abusive homes. There are over 1,000 of them that are waiting for a CASA volunteer. CASA volunteer, like Scott, goes through 30 hours of training to learn how to hear the stories, and to walk alongside children who have been the victims of abuse or have witnessed abuse in families who have been removed from their families. These are the most vulnerable people in our world, children who cannot speak for themselves, caught in the foster care system and in this going back and forth. Scott's calling responsibility as an advocate is to spend upwards 
of 15 hours a month or more with these children and to be their advocates. When these children end up in the court, in the court, Scott is there to speak for them and to speak on their behalf. I asked Scott, why do you do this? He said, when you, I just have always been taught as a Christian that when you see something that needs to be done, you just need to do it. The problems that are going on in our world are not going to be solved with all the hateful political climate that we see in our world. It's not going to be solved by our government, but by God's people being God's people in the world and standing up for people who have no one to stand up for them and then we doing what we need to do to do the right thing. Putting a house in Eden Village isn't going to change the whole homeless population, but it will for that one person. And by the way, you know who we're trying to put in that house? The young man that we put up in Studio Star for a month called Brad Johnson this week. said, Brad, can we get our friend in this house? And we're cooking him up with the, we hope he qualifies. If he does, there's going to be a party and you're going to be invited when he gets the keys to his first home. And Brad Johnson didn't work for the city government to, fi- to fix a problem. He, just bought, he retired from his business, sold his business, and took his money and bought a piece of land. He's got his name all over it and is doing what he can. It's messy. It's not easy to do justice. But that's what it looks like. Now, I, I may get in trouble with this statement, but I've been in trouble before. I think one of the biggest problems that we face today that magnifies and makes everything worse is the hateful, divisive, polarizing political commentary of everybody blaming everybody. And while people on the left are blaming people on the right and the people on the right are blaming people on the left, people struggle and they suffer and nothing gets done. We have to stop playing that game. Don't get caught up in that game in this season this year. Don't be those people. Because in this church, we have left, we have right, we have conservative people, we have liberal people. But what we're trying to do in this church is to come together and solve problems and be God's people. I can't change that, but I can change how I live, and you can change how you live. And that's why on Christmas Eve, you gave $28,000 to be matched by another $25,000 to change a single mom's life and put her in a home. That is justice. Don't be pulled into the stupidity of our culture that God absolutely despises and hates and condemns. So Martin Luther King Jr., he uh, was in Memphis the day before he died, and he was there because he was trying to help sanitation workers. Two men had been crushed in the back of a dump truck when they were a uh, garbage truck when they were trying to eat their lunch. So he'd gone there to help their case. And the day before he was killed, murdered, assassinated, he preached a sermon on the Good Samaritan. And this is what he said. He said, those religious people saw that man in the ditch, but they didn't help him because they looked at that man in the ditch and thought to themselves, if I help that man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan, on the other hand, looked that man in the ditch and said, if I don't don't help that man, what will happen to him? Do you know what that is? Looking at a person and asking the question, if I don't help that person, what will happen to him? Do you know what that is? Come on, say it. What is it? Come on now, what is it? Amen.